Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm going to try to take you through what a commercialization plan is in 90 minutes. Uh, and since we already have only 88 minutes, let me get started. So I am terrible at watching all of you while I'm talking. Hannah and Adrian and Telvin are going to do that for me. Um, uh, so uh, please bear with us if, if there's a little delay in, in that. Uh, I'll just remind you of our team. In addition to um, Hannah and me, of course, Peter Reinhardt uh, really is leading this effort. Uh, and I want to introduce the, our three summer business innovation fellows. I'll say more about them in a little while. But Telvin, Telvin Abariga, Adrian Berry, and James Hoconia are with us for the summer. They are also with us for the uh, academic year. They're business innovation fellows in IELTS Venture Development. And they work with um, uh, startups based on uh, UMass research. So we would love to hear from you. Uh, even uh, aside from the Manning Isles Awards. Uh, the Manning Isles program mission is to advance translational and applied R&D efforts throughout the development of spin-outs, uh, through the development of spin-out startup companies or throughout licensing uh, of UMass IP. So we are here to support you to get to that point where you can start a company or out license the IP. Uh, this is a graph you should all have seen before. The concept is that you're starting with basic research uh, for the most part, and that we want to move you up into these, um, this sector with the red dots. We want to move you up and through it to the point where you, uh, you're ready to, for an investment ready startup. You have technology that's ready for investment uh, through venture capital or federal funding agencies or um, uh, some other vehicle that we'll talk about, uh, but also to ready you to, to out license uh, you IP directly from UMass to a uh, larger company. And also, I just always want to remind people uh, also to get to the point where you are actually in a position to uh, make sales, to gain revenue from customers, to provide uh, something of real value to somebody who's going to really use it. Uh, that's unusual for a, an academic startup or university startup, but I don't ever wanna lose sight of it because actually as you go through with investors, they're not losing sight of the fact that you need to get to that point as well. So the Manning Isles uh, funding vehicle is really meant for startup teams and concepts that are within one to two years of that external funding. And so that's really important to keep in mind as we talk about the commercialization plan for your proposal, because that gives you the, the, the time constraints that uh, we're thinking about. So uh, one of the questions that comes up often is, uh, how do I do this with just the executive summary? Uh, cram all of this stuff in. The truth is that a, the commercialization plan that you talk about in your executive summary is gonna have implications for every other item in the proposal. And so we we want you to be thinking about the very high level and the executive summary, but then also be thinking about how does that change what you would ordinarily say or what it, you would change if you weren't thinking about commercialization in terms of the statement of work, the progress to date, uh, intellectual property, uh, budget, et cetera. Uh, for uh, one example, I will point out is in this biosketches area. If you have industry mentors or industry um, industry people who will join a startup with you or will advise your startup, we would urge you to to uh, put that information into the biosketches. Uh, so, so uh, you know, for somebody from industry that may not be a biosketch, that might be. Uh, a download of their LinkedIn profile, all of that is perfectly fine. Uh, as well, up to three letters of support. If you have a potential industry partner who's telling you, you know, if you could do X, Y, Z, try X, Y, Z, and it will work in your uh, research laboratory, then we would be 
wanting to take it to the next level in terms of talking with you about how we could invest in you, how we could partner with you, how we could uh, how we could uh, expand on the the research by taking it on in our lab in our industry laboratories. So very important to think broadly about the commercialization plan in that way. Uh, so I'm hoping that now that I've said that I have at least checked off this first question, what is meant by a commercialization plan? But the truth is we're gonna talk about all of these questions throughout. Uh, these are some questions that uh, have come onto our radar screen in conversations, uh, not just with you, but in my 20 years of talking with university, uh, you know, faculty and graduate student entrepreneurs. If you see something that, uh, I haven't answered at the end. I'll put this list up later. Please uh, put a question in the chat. Raise your hand if you uh, if you want to discuss further. Please emphasize that. And if you have another question, add that to the chat, please. This is really um, meant to be an informative dis uh, discussion that meets your needs. So, what is a commercialization plan? Let me get down below the the level at which we were talking before. Really, we're thinking about a living document. Obviously, it's going to be static in the proposal, but we look at this as a plan, not a promise. And we would expect for Manning Isles recipients to work with you uh, as, as the research goes on, to work with you on evolving that commercialization plan in response to new things you learn and that we would learn about the business, you would learn about the business. But the real, uh, the, the high lo highest level, uh, concept here is it's really your plan for de-risking the business, which includes the technology, but also uh, does anybody want it? There's a bunch of different things to say about that and to add value. And we'll talk about what those kinds of things are. But when you think about either one of those, those, uh, and you think about milestones, milestones are really those points that you have made a significant advance to de-risk, reduce the risk that the venture will succeed or the technology will succeed or to add value in some way to the, to the uh, startup or to the future startup. So those are the kinds of things we're thinking about in terms of milestones. Uh, it's also a roadmap and a, a source document. So uh, you wanna think, think about synchronizing your R&D and non-R&D efforts. Uh, when you think about the external reviewers we have, they're all looking for that. Is this is this a team that understands that in addition to making progress on the science, they need to make progress on the non-scientific uh, elements that, it go, that go into a startup or go into securing a licensee. Uh, another thing is grant applications and investor pitches. So as you start to lay out your commercialization plan, you're gonna come to a deeper understanding of the resources you need going forward. And you can start thinking about that. And we will do a fun exercise at the end. I hope it'll be fun. Uh, and then in the call itself, we have asked for you to address six key elements. What are your product candidates? What unmet need are you going to satisfy? And um, how are you, your differentiation plan? How are you going to be different in a way that will be meaningful to your customers, investors, uh, strategic partners, uh, the, the people who are really gonna uh, be with you taking this forward to the marketplace. Um, what's your intellectual property plan? That's broader than uh, the UMass uh, intellectual property that you have you have or are, are creating right now. It really imagines, it really challenges you to imagine, could you create additional intellectual property as a company uh, or with a licensing partner? Uh, Assembling a startup team or a spin out team, super important. Uh, it, you, it quickly gets to the point where you will need uh, other people, uh, except possibly for a licensing, uh, a licensing uh, plan. But even then, you're going to need uh, advisors, somebody who's done it before, uh, experience. So, so think about who should be on your team. And then what resources do you need to support development into a self-sufficient enterprise or to get to a license, uh, a licensing deal? So Manning Isles is, is 
$100,000, Manning Isles Awards are up to $100,000, but really they are to get you to an inflection point where you can get additional funding, uh, either through uh, investors or federal funds like the SBIR program or through, um, uh, or through customers. So this is really, how are we expecting to get from an idea to an operating funded startup or, uh, or a license? At IELTS Venture Development, we are really thinking about this all the time, how this is how we expect to get from an idea to an operating plan. And it helps when you are in the middle of a journey to have a little bit of a map. So we think of this and the fellows are all trained to use this instrument. We think about ventures as being in three stages, ideation and conceptualization, exploration and validation and implementation and commercialization. And we really are wanting you to, wherever you are in this, to work toward that commercialization end. Uh, we think about that in uh, these six different categories, technology and product, intellectual property, team and venture structures, market discovery and development, funding and in-kind resources and business model and business plan. And we assess the ventures we're working with regularly on, on this area. I'm gonna show you in a minute how this intersects with the commercialization plan elements, but I'm gonna, at the end, I'm gonna remind you that the fellows are available through office hours to help you uh, get your bearings in this uh, as well by uh, working through this uh, scorecard with you to figure out where you are. And you might be very far to the right here on something like intellectual property and still be in the ideation conceptualization stage uh, in something else. So that's fine. The important thing is to know where you are, not how far you've come yet. So when I started to put this together, you know, it quickly became evident that every one of these six key commercialization plan uh, elements actually intersect with our all of our venture assessment categories. So, for example, if you're building a technology, a, a product out of your technology, you really want to know what problem are you trying to solve for a customer. That's the unmet need, and then you also want to know: uh, is my product going to be different and better? in a way that's gonna be meaningful for that customer. So you need the differentiation plan for that. And then the intellectual property plan, yes, you have IP from your research, but as you start to go from technology to product, it's well worth uh, thinking about whether you're creating other intellectual property. And so you wanna keep that in mind. And then what startup team, team do you need? If you're bringing a therapeutic to market, you might need, uh, uh, you, you will need a clinician on your team. Now that may not be somebody who's working full-time in the business, that may be an advisor, but you're gonna need, uh, you're gonna need broader perspective as you start to uh, think, go from technology to product. And then finally, resources to support the self-sustaining effort. As you start to move from technology to product, you start to get a much better idea of how much that's going to cost. And so you, you start to get a, better understanding and, and, and a better ability to predict uh, costs. So, uh, so one of the things that I, I just wanna emphasize here is this is where we're really looking for how does the R&D effort sync up with the statement of work? Uh, the, or it's, how does the R&D effort in the statement of work sync up with these other elements? And that's something that goes back to the implications from the transferring the implications of the executive summary into the rest of your proposal. So I just want to touch on each of these elements that we've named uh, a little bit, and I'm going to go really fast through this part uh, because I want to uh, have time for questions, but it's, it's worth thinking about this. Uh, you know, you're starting with you might be starting here with a core technology, a molecule, a little bit of software, you know, an algorithm, um, a, an early device, or maybe some piece parts for a device, or a material with some really cool properties, or a new method, all of those things, fantastic core technology. 
Uh, but as you start to move forward toward commercialization, you're really wanting to think about what am I doing with that technology, that core technology? And so you, you really want to think about, well, what does a product look like? Uh, that could be a therapeutic candidate. It could be uh, that you want to create a demo. Uh, it could be that you're developing prototypes of some sort. Um, if you are pretty far along, you might be thinking about developing a minimum viable product. That's something that a customer could actually use and uh, a customer with a huge problem might actually pay for. Uh, and then uh, a pilot, you might think about a pilot version of the product for a customer that is going to pay for it. So those are all sort of uh, midway points in commercialization. But ultimately, for commercialization, you're really looking to create a product or a service or something that would be licensable uh, or investable, which usually it's, it's unusual these days for an investor to take on, uh, uh, make an investment in, in something that doesn't have customers or doesn't have a, a prototype. That's, I think it's very unusual. So you can think about needing that early version of the product for an investor uh, and also for strategic partners. Uh, so, so this is the whole spectrum. Uh, and I just wanna, because we've got such a broad group here, I wanna just take a minute to, to ask if, if just, to check that make sure that everyone sees themselves in this continuum in some way. If you don't and you uh, are thinking about, well, how would I conceptualize a product? We would, I'd love to discuss that if not now at the end. Anybody, any takers right now? No, okay. So if you've got a product, What's your product doing? You ideally are meeting an unmet need uh, and you really want to, uh, you know, who, what problem are you gonna solve? Whose needs will you meet? There are a bunch of different ways to think about unmet needs. Uh, there's a very high level societal problems, you know, climate change, uh, COVID-19 needs to be addressed. Uh, potential for new pandemics needs to be addressed. Uh, social justice and equity challenges. All of those are, could be classified as unmet needs. Another group of unmet needs are technical challenges. Right now, we don't know how to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, store, store, renewable, uh, store electricity from renewables in an efficient way. How are we gonna do that? Uh, how can we do things that we do know how to do now better, faster, cheaper? All of those technical challenges, again, unmet needs. But where does the real, uh, where does the rubber meet the road with unmet needs? It's really customer needs and wants. So it's great to start with a high level unmet need, but you really wanna drill down to uh, who has the problem? How severe is it? How many people have the problem? And it really is about people, even if it's about an organization, people, inside organizations are making decisions. And then who will pay, uh, oh, I've got a typo, who will pay uh, for your solution? Super important to, to um, be thinking about now, even before you have a solution. And the reason it's important is that the number one reason startups fail, um, CB Insights did a survey a few years ago. The number one reason is that uh, there was no market need. Uh, they built something that no one wanted. So, so there are some good techniques. We teach them in my i program on how to de-risk that a little bit. So uh, I'll give the link for that later on. But uh, again, this is what we mean by unmet needs. You may not be able to go all the way to customer needs yet, but, uh, but we want you to be thinking about it. And uh, finally, I will just say a note, customers are broadly construed here. So definitely end users, definitely people with a problem. Uh, if you think about a therapeutic, you know, the patient with a, an untreatable disease or uh, a disease that needs better treatment, but also 
the doctors, or the clinicians, the healthcare providers that are working with them uh, would be to some degree end users, but also investors. Uh, you know, we don't, th we think of investors as people with money who are throwing it around, but, but investors uh, have problems too. And their problem might be they are looking for uh, the next great opportunity and uh, within the context of their portfolio. You want to understand what that is. But they too will be looking at is at the end of the day, if I invest, does anybody, is anybody going to buy the product or the technology that's being produced? And so you really need to always go back to the end user. It's the same is true with strategic partners and potential licensees. So your differentiation plan um, actually is, again, from a, a broad perspective, uh, why are you different and better in the long term? Why is your product, why is your solution different and better in the long term? From the perspective, not from your perspective, but from the customer perspective and from the perspective of the technology community, the investment community. So, uh, you know, from a technology perspective, you will want to understand who are your scientific competitors, who are your business competitors, are there alternative approaches to uh, solving the problem. Uh, so you don't want to get too, too uh, much about, you know, the, the only way to solve the problem is my way. It's, uh, it's really much broader than that. And you want to think about that. Um, from a funding perspective, how am I going to stand out to investors? Uh, do I match with their mission and priorities? Uh, are there portfolio considerations? Do I have something special that is going to fit with the rest of the companies they've invested in? Again, take some work and some thinking. We don't expect you to have all the answers, but we want you to be thinking about these things. And finally, the customer perspective, the most important perspective. Um, are you matched with customer needs and wants, uh, but can you still stand out from the crowd? of competing in alternative solutions. So I've just given you a little um, competitive matrix, it's called here, a sample, obviously made up. Um, but uh, you can see that you would, you would wanna have something like this, you know, bunch of competitors in the columns, your, your team, your startup uh, over here on the right. You'd ideally like to identify uh, rows of, of things that are really important to your customer. Uh, is it a, is a certain efficacy level important? Uh, think about think about um, you know drugs, but also think about uh, solutions to other problems. Uh, efficacy is often something that's that's important to customers. Um, non toxic, uh, just an arbitrary uh, uh, element that is sometimes important in a lot of products. Is it shelf stable? Or sometimes you will say, what would be the range of temperatures within this could operate? Or um, I've seen uh, examples um, um, out in industry where people are very concerned about uh, an industrial part, a new industrial part, or a filter, or a uh, you know, or a uh, some part of the process. Can it withstand temperatures above, you know, uh, two hundred? Uh, C or or 100 C or can it operate at very low temperatures? Those are all things that you may not be thinking about now, but if you think about the customer perspective, they have a problem to solve and they need to solve it within a certain temperature range. Uh, if you can do that and nobody else can, that's fantastic. So intellectual property. Um, as I mentioned before, we're really thinking about uh, the, the IP landscape, about how you're gonna build protection long-term. Uh, so, so you wanna, you wanna of course, create um, a, a IP on campus. We want you to do that too. And that's a great start. Uh, I know people are concerned about the tech transfer office and, and the, the fact that uh, the U UMass owns the intellectual property. I would challenge you to look at it a different way. In industry, if um, uh, you know, if, if an industry scientist invents something, um, the company owns it, and they don't get any 
uh, any say in commercialization, any involvement in it, and they don't share in the future profits other than they might get a great performance review. And they might Aaron, get- Before we progress into IP, we do have a question in the chat from Katrina Fitzpatrick regarding, oh. I believe the differentiation plan. So Katrina, Katrina, you unmute. Did you wanna ask the question, Katrina? Or maybe you just want to read it. I, I can just read the question also. Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute for a second. Um, <laughs> yeah, so when you're talking about the differentiation plan and mm -hmm. like including a table like this, um, would that also be, it'd be better to, can you put more details like the table in the progress to date preliminary data? Or is this something you would want in the executive summary? No, I, I, I first of all, I, I don't think you need, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to put a table like this in, okay. uh, but if you decide to, I think you should put it where it makes fits best in terms of your story. If you, okay. for example, I could imagine someone putting in the statement of work. If you say, say, here are the aims of our statement of work. And this is why we are doing this because we know that, uh, you know, the operating temperature is really important to potential customers. And we see the competitors, there's no competitor out there in industry. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Anybody else before I move on? Okay. Thanks, Karen. I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, please, to bring that to your please, attention. Please do jump in because I'm not looking. You are. <laughs> so for intellectual property, uh, I'll just, you know, I, as I said. Uh, UMass, the TTO is patenting things for you. You would, uh, if you form a startup, you would license it from them. Uh, unlike industry where you might get $1,000 if you got a patent granted uh, and then a great performance review, you will get, uh, you, you know, you, you basically get here uh, the opportunity to license the IP you've created uh, to get a return as the investor. Uh, and I think, but I think in the near term, the most important thing to say is that, yes, if you license the technology, you will um, eventually have to pay back patent costs if your startup is successful. But in the meantime, you have an, in, an interest-free loan, uh, essentially. They are, you do not have to foot the patent expenses upfront, which many startups outside of academia do. So, Beyond that, you really want to understand the patent landscape and uh, understand who might be competitors. Uh, you, need, you need to understand what's called freedom to operate. So there might be industries that are actually off, uh, you can't operate in unless you license technology from someone. Uh, you really want to understand all of that. And so I want to, in addition to giving you this link here to the tech transfer offices uh, section for inventors that has all the forms, their forms and the policies. I wanna mention, I hope you all know about the Patent and Trademark Resource Center at the UMass Science and Engineering Library. Paulina Borrego leads it. She's got specialized patent searching uh, tools and because it's a PTRC, uh, she has the patent examiner's database available. She can train you and you or a student if you're not, if you're for the, for the uh, PIs here, uh, she can train uh, someone to do patent searches and help you understand the, the competition that is already ongoing outside of the scholarly literature. So it's super important resource for everybody to know about if they're thinking about commercialization. And then, um, your startup team, really who's going to do what needs to be done. Uh, so there, there are two things about this. Uh, the faculty here are all already running small businesses in a sense that they've got, you've got grants going on, you've got graduate students working for you. You may have undergraduates working for you. Um, so you have, and it is easy to think, you have all the skills you need. And in terms of skills, uh, that may well be the case, but in terms of the sheer level of activity that goes on in a startup, you really need to find other people. And if you think about it on campus, you have those other people. You're just, you just take them for granted. So 
Do you have an accountant? You know, is somebody doing the bookkeeping on your grants? Is somebody um, paying the payroll? Is someone cleaning the, cleaning the lab? All of those things you're gonna think about. And some of those things you're gonna think about, who do I have to hire? So, so uh, the first thing is to say, who's gonna found this company with me? Am I gonna build it all alone? I will tell you that the other statistic is that multi-person teams are much more likely to succeed than solo teams. So really important to think about who are your founders. Uh, very often they're your co-inventors, the people in your lab. And very often um, one model is a postdoc uh, in the lab or a graduate student graduates and then assumes leadership for the, the company. Uh, so that, that's something to, to think about. And uh, this article that I've posted here is a great resource for thinking about that. How to spin your, spin your scientific research out of a university and into a startup. And they really talk about who do you need and uh, how to think about these things. Uh, it goes a little bit against conventional wisdom, but it's from Y Combinator, which is a hugely respected uh, venture accelerator and uh, a real thought leader. So I, I think it's a great article um, for you all to look at. And I would also, the last thing I'd say about your team is, I'm not just talking about employees, we're talking about who do you need as business advisor or technology advisor? Can you get somebody from inter industry? There we're back to, well, where's your focus? What's the unmet need you're focusing on? Uh, and then service providers, uh, you know, uh, attorney, uh, accountant, uh, uh, you know, insurance, if you're starting a company, all of those things are important. You don't need to think about those in detail now, but you should at least be thinking about the founding team. And then uh, funding and other in-kind resources to fuel the, pro you know, how are you getting uh, the fuel you need for the project? Um, so, so funding we think about in several buckets. The, the, I put customers and sales there and I'll talk about them in a little bit, but grants, investors and industry partners are the three uh, big buckets uh, of, of uh, funding sources. Uh, investors uh, often, uh, well, investors will take a share of the company. Grants are non-dilutive for the most part. Um, sometimes they uh, open opportunities for, uh, for follow-on funding as investment, but grants mean you're not giving up part of your company. Investors uh, bring dilutive funding, so they'll take a, either a share of your company or they will, uh, they will, uh, you will be obligated in some way to give them a share later on. Industry partners very often um, uh, want something else. They may want a share of your company, but they may want um, to co-create IP. It's very important to understand what the, what the funding is for and what your obligations will be. And then customers and sales, um, I just never wanna lose sight of the fact that if you can make a sale, you're, you're generating some revenue um, that will at least offset some expenses. In-kind resources are, especially at the very early stage and especially before you have an entity are really important to think about. Do you have advisors and mentors from industry? Uh, you know, Peter Reinhardt and I are internal advisors on campus. Uh, he and I both have lots of experience uh, in industry, but we're very keen on helping you to secure uh, other advisors and mentors from beyond the campus. I would also say, don't overlook your networks. That's the place to start. So especially for um, uh, faculty, Think about, do you have students who have graduated and gone into industry? Do you have colleagues from graduate school who are now working in industry? Who in your network knows some of the things that you need to know? Uh, startup law office hours, which we hold monthly. Uh, Matt Whitehead comes and will give you advice on um, before you're ready to have an entity, before you're ready to have your own lawyer. Uh, he'll give you some advice on on startup law, and then the Business Innovation Fellows Program. You know, we provide lots of help in terms of business research uh, and analysis, and in terms of actually finding 
identifying funding sources and all sorts of things that startups outside of the university uh, have to figure out how to get in some other way. So don't forget about revenue for, from customers and don't forget about licensing agreements as a source of revenue uh, or as a source of funding for, for something ongoing. But I wanna take a minute to look at these logos here. Uh, so, you know, so i uh, we have a, I lead the i site on campus. We have a very small program that has very uh, small bits of funding to reimburse a few expenses. But the national i program that we qualify you for uh, comes with $50,000 of funding for a team that goes through that. And that's funding to do customer discovery, which is not ordinarily covered by any other grant mechanism. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's not a lot compared to basic research grants, but it's important to think about. Venture Well, for, for you who have graduate students working on the project, Venture Well is a, uh, is a nonprofit organization designed, aiming to support engineer, engineering and science students. And they have small grant programs to support prototyping and to train graduate students and undergraduates in the business side of, um, of STEM-driven startups. So uh, we've had really good, full disclosure, I um, review for them, but, but the, the experience we've had has been extremely positive. Uh, if you are thinking about a foundation, uh, funding from a nonprofit foundation, which sometimes is, is uh, you know, looks like very small dollars compared to an NIH or an NSF grant, but my some foundations actually will provide funding in this translational research space. Sometimes, occasionally going to the small business, often going to a, a faculty lab, but uh, this, is a, this is just a logo for our library's uh, license to the, to the foundation database. Uh, fellow business innovation fellows use this all the time to look for foundations that might be funding something uh, where they recognize the unmet customer need and they are trying to uh, encourage development of solutions. Uh, SBIRs are a whole topic unto themselves, small business innovation resource, research and small business technology transfer uh, funding. Uh, those funds go to uh, go to a small business and uh, they're a very important source of funding before you're ready for investors. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but these are all organizations that I think of when I'm working with startups uh, to think about where's their next funding coming from. And of course, we're really so glad that you're going, you're, you're thinking about writing a proposal to Manning Isles. We are so happy to be able to provide seed funding at the stage you all are at now. Uh, so, so this is the very earliest funding and uh, we are really pleased to have this opportunity to help. So bringing it all together, if you think about it, I just wanna remind you all that, you know, all of the things we've talked about, yes, they go into the executive summary, but also the statement of work, the milestones, the budget, the people, the other appendices, uh, the, the progress to date, all of that uh, is, is an opportunity to reflect on these things. All right, and now we're gonna do our fun exercise. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna to continue to share, but basically what we've got here at the top is um, R&D to move uh, technology from lab to practical commercially viable application. So this is, the Manning Isles, uh, you know, the, we can think about this either as uh, the Manning Isles timeline, or you could think about it as going all the way to, um, uh, you know, a, a longer term commercial outcome. But we've got a bunch of uh, things, you know, so that's the R&D part. What about the other things you have to do? We've already talked about product, IP, team, uh, customers, you know, market and customer uh, development. And, and funding. And so here at the bottom are a bunch of activities actually that we would like you to think about. And this is something that startups do think about. In the purple uh, products, uh, you know, how am I, get, what's my product development gonna look like 
relative to my R&D on the technology? Where does it fit in? Where am I going to actually uh, you know, get the prototype done that can get out of the lab? Um, when am I gonna start contacting regulators about uh, my product and, and um, uh, approving my product for the marketplace? Uh, perhaps the first thing, I'm guessing that the most, the thing that uh, come, would come first uh, would be uh, intellectual property. So here we have provisional patent application, UMass invention disclosure, a, a granted patent and a non-provisional um, UMass patent application. So I'm just going to open the, even though I can't see you very well, I'm, I want to open this to discussion and ask, uh, you know, we're going to start to move some of these toward, uh, just to put conceptually, oh, sorry, I need to come out of full screen here. Um, we're going to put, move some of these around on the slide and, um, give some practice in developing this kind of commercialization plan. So um, we'll start with what I'm hoping that um, if, does everybody know what an invention disclosure is? If not, um, it is the, the, first, the first thing you uh, put together for the tech transfer office and uh, to say, ah, I think I may have invented something in the course of my UMass research. So I will start the party by putting that over here, even before you're starting your, your, your translational research. But now, who would like to suggest a place for the provisional patent application to come? Just unmute and tell me where to put it. Fellows, you just had a briefing on this the other day. Uh, after or below the invention disclosure? Yes, it will definitely come after the invention disclosure. And we don't know where it might come. Sometimes it comes right away. I'm going to put it here right away. But sometimes after an invention disclosure, the TTO will say, you know, we need more data or if you could do or this isn't patentable just as it is now, but if you could uh, add, um, you know, if you could add this or get more data about that, uh, then we could file a provisional. So this is already, uh, you know, you're already starting to move forward in the, in the thinking about how are you gonna pr protect an invention? All right, now how about the non-provisional patent application? After the provisional. After the provisional and after, after probably after you've gotten some data on uh, that somebody would really want this and some more data on that feasibility. So we will, um, we will uh, give a little bit of a gap there. And after you file a provisional, you have a year to file the, the non-provisional. So, all right. And then of course the granted patent comes after that. And it often comes much after that. But once you have the non-provisional in place, you're protected. But which one of these looks like a real milestone? Remember what we talked about uh, that milestones, uh, the best milestones are at either reducing risk or adding value. So, so um, how does everybody feel about, is the, is the invention disclosure a milestone? No. Is the provisional patent an application a milestone? No, but probably people will want to know that you have done it because, because if you haven't done it, there's a missing piece. Well, they know you've got a year to do something. So. Yeah, they know exactly. They know you've got a year to do something exactly right, Joe. Is the non-provisional patent a milestone? The application? It is. It is, but, and, and, it, and it gives you more time, but has it, what's the big milestone here? The granted patent is the big milestone. And think about that, until you've gotten that grant, pat, patent granted in your hand, you don't, there's uncertainty about it. And so by getting the 
the the patent granted, you you reduce the risk that that's not going to happen, and and uh, so you want to be thinking about all of these, and you want to be thinking about each of these elements in terms of what value does it add and what risk does it mitigate. Okay, so how about on the product side? You also want to think about the lab demo, the prototype. Now, I am guessing that people figure that the prototype comes before the MVP. And in many industries, it does. Certainly in, um, uh, you know, if you have a device, it will. But there are some uh, circumstances where an MVP may actually come before you have a working prototype. And the most famous example of this is, well, they're called Wizard of Oz companies. They're able to do whatever it is they say they're going to do without actually developing the technology. Zappos, if you've ever ordered shoes from Zappos, Zappos did this. They built a website, they bought some shoes, they put them online on pictures, they sold them if they could. But they didn't have a warehouse, they didn't have an algorithm, they had a lot of people working behind the scenes to do what they eventually had to build with technology. So you really want to think about this minimum viable product. Where, where can you engage customers? Where's the earliest point and with what? And then regulators, again, very dependent on your industry. I'm going to put this arbitrarily here, but for those of you thinking about therapeutics, initial contact with regulator is going to look really different from those of you who are thinking about infrastructure where the EPA may weigh in. And each of those are sort of customized. All right. So you get the idea. I'll leave the rest of this to you unless you have specific questions about timing. But I, I really want to say that, uh, you know, if you were in a startup, you might do this on a whiteboard with post-it notes and just start moving things around. So questions, comments? Yeah, Shelley. Where does the IRB fit into this? Ah, well, we don't have that here because this is our generic product. But yes, you have, thank you for asking that question. You need to think about if you're thinking, and it may, you, it's probably in the technology plan. Um, you need to think about if you have, if you need an IRB or if you need um, IACUC approval or, uh, or you need, um, uh, you know, materials from a collaborator, you're going to need to think about all of those kind of pieces to get uh, approvals for your and permissions for, for the research you want to do. And this is by no means, this example is by no means meant to be exhaustive or to apply exactly to your project. It's meant to show you that and, and to remind you that you can think about and you need to think about in commercialization, the research and development that you're doing, that effort, but you also need to think about doing other things in parallel. So it sort of ties into the secure a pilot customer in some ways. It could, it could. Um, Absolutely. So, and, and I think the other thing to, so the IRB and IACUC, yeah, if you're going to do, if you're going to work with animals, you need IACUC, you know, review and all of that. But also, I think the other thing people think about is, uh, people need to think about is funding. So you want to lead the target in terms of, of um, funding. Uh, you know you want to uh, well, let's just quiz. Those of you who already know the answer to this, well, maybe you won't know the answer to this. Uh, you know, if you if you're thinking about getting an uh, doing an SBI, applying for an SBIR, you need to think first. You're you're required to have a, a company, and so let's let's just uh, you, you know you have to form a, an entity, and so so you need and conventional wisdom is you need to. Uh, form the entity about three months before you actually submit an SBIR application because there's a bunch of uh, registrations and things you need to do before the government, will, before the feds will accept your application. Um, 
or before you're eligible to accept. Well, what do you have to do before you form that entity? You have to identify the founding team. So you might put that here and then, uh, oh, I can't see, I have to close you all up a little bit uh, and apply for an SBIR might come here, uh, but you might, uh, you know, then you need to establish the entity uh, here. And it, the SBIR funding is dependent on uh, you're establishing an entity and establishing an entity is dependent on you finding, identifying your founding team. Uh, so, so you may, you start to, as you start to put this together, you start to think about these interdependencies. Uh, another one is uh, apply for i national funding. So it's uh, SBIR review takes about six to eight months uh, before you learn about the fate of your proposal. Uh, i national funding takes, uh, sometimes it takes as many as six weeks, but often it is less than that. And the other important thing to know about i national funding is for NSF, SBIRs, uh, having done an i national project, Teams project, increases the success rate submitting by, by those, submitted by those teams. I haven't put here Partnership for Innovation funding, but um, Chul Park, who's on the call this, this afternoon, has done that. And you can, so you want to start thinking about all these different funding vehicles uh, and, and when are you going to need that funding and for what and, and can you get it quickly enough to just maintain the momentum of your research program as well as your venture development uh, uh, efforts. Uh, so all of these things are some of the many activities that you might engage in as a, as a pre-startup or a startup. Many of these can, can, you can do before you have established an entity. And uh, we would love to talk to you about any and all of this stuff. Karen, yes. realistically, uh, we're, I'm trying to put a time, actual years on that timeline. This timeline, if it covers a two year window, wouldn't granted patent be off the screen to the right? It, yeah, very much so. And Very so we're really, if we were talking about a one to two year startup filling, getting funding for that period when you're trying to build the business, then you have to build the business before you ever can conceive of a patent being funded or, or a patent being granted. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's a risk factor investors will take into account. Okay. There are sometimes ways to speed, speed up you know, I mean, it usually involves money, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, but this is also why uh, thinking ahead about uh, about what intellectual property you would create as a startup is important too, because the more intellectual property you have, you know, the the the, the conventional wisdom, at least, is the stronger your your case, your you know, your your uh, competitive differentiation can be and your sustainable competitive advantage can be. So, you, you know, and, and very often teams really do noodle about this and you start to make trade-offs, you know, no, we aren't gonna have the data for the SBIR until, you know, three months, you know, so we're gonna have three months later than we want it. So we're gonna have to figure out how to fill in that, you know, what we're gonna do in the meantime, it becomes very practical very quickly. Anyone else? Am I talking you all out of writing a proposal? I hope not. All right, so I just wanna check in on these questions that we asked originally. And I, I'm hoping, I'm gonna give you a minute to look at these and really, uh, you know, uh, call me out on ones that are, or ask further clarifying questions on any of these that uh, you, I, that I have an answer to your satisfaction, or at least as, as well as I, I think I can. And, and then also, uh, you know, please uh, 
put questions in the chat or just speak up at this point. Karen, yes. Joe here. Yes. So in terms of the commercialization plan for the executive, I'm thinking this in terms of just the Manning Niles funding right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Can defining the, can milestones proposed as part of the proposal to develop a business be things like plan in an application to i uh, defining your advisory board, are those milestones or no? I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think you should think about all of those as milestones. Certainly external, having an external advisory board is a milestone. What it says is that there are people in industry who think it's an interesting enough project that industry, someone in industry should be paying attention. But does that need to be defined before we apply for the Manny Niles or is it something that can be a milestone within the Manny Niles? I think I, well, you know, I'm, I'm a person with a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. So I think to me, what I would love to see, but I'm not, you know, all the reviewers, uh, I would love to see, I like to see milestones that, that sync up the non-technical, non-R&D uh, aspects of uh, commercialization with the, the, the statement of work and what you're, you know, the, the, lion's share of the effort to do the R&D. Um, Hannah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so we, um, as Karen mentioned earlier, I really like this phrase of it's a plan, not a promise. So um, there may be aspects that you may, um, that may come up in a, in a practical way that, that may change or alter a little bit of your plan. Um, and there's opportunity, I think, uh, throughout the course, if you're awarded uh, a Manning Isles Award, to kind of course correct if needed. And um, we're always trying to find the best way to progress your project, even if that doesn't stick uh, word to word to your proposal. So um, whatever you can think of as a milestone or progress that you'd like to make for your project, I don't think it's a bad idea to include it in your proposal, but we're not gonna hold you to every word on uh, written on the proposal, of course. We're always there to have a conversation and to make sure that that plan still works for your project. So are you basically saying more is better than less? Uh, just, just we just want to see that the PIs and the project, uh, the the teams are thinking through um, every aspect of the project, not just the research and technology development, but also the commercialization side. So yeah, I think in a way we could say more is better than less for sure. With within the page limits. Within the page limits, yes. <laughs> yeah, but but I, and and I th I think even to Joe, you constrained it to the Manning Isles proposal, but I would say more broadly speaking than the Manning Isles proposal. Being, thinking about all of those things really will increase your probability of success because those are all things you need to do and ultimately. And, and to me, one of the values of having a plan, you know, it's not, the, it's not the plan, it's the planning kind of thing. I mean, it's so trite, but it's so true. You know, it, means that you're, you're gonna to start to do things in parallel rather than sequentially and think that way and understand where the interdependencies are. So I think it's really important to think that way. Yeah, Sasha. So I, I have a question which is maybe not absolutely relevant to that meeting, but so when you think about budget and if you plan to start your startup within this uh, period funded by Manning Grant, so, uh, what type of uh, expenses are usually coming with the starting of a startup? So how much money you need to reserve for that? <laughs> yeah, I, well, as usual, it depends, you know, it depends on a bunch of things. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the things you could start to do is actually, um, you know, reach out to, uh, well, uh, you you know, for those of you who know Matt Whitehead from Startup Law Office Hours, you could ask him what is you know what is a typical, what does it typically cost to form the entity, uh, you know, and 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 it's not it's not a huge that part is not a huge amount. So I actually asked him this question. Mm -hmm. He told me ten thousand. Yeah, that's 
that's a that's I was going to say. I think it will be ten thousand or less. Okay, because I asked some other people and they say we did not pay anything. We started everything ourselves. Yes. So let me editorialize for a minute. It is possible to do that, and many have done it. Um, they'll do it online. They'll form a company online. Uh, the the creation of the entity is not the hard part. The hard part is uh, some of the other agreements that go with it and that are really important. If you have a founding team, what's the equity split among the founders? And 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 more than that, you do not want to just give out the equity and say, now everybody owns a third for, forever and ever. What if someone decides to leave? What are you going to do then? So you need to have uh, a vesting plan. There are, none of these things are extraordinary or out of the ordinary, but they all need attention. And, and um, you know, and I have, I know, not here, not in this room, but I am aware of startups that have gone the, the, um, you know, the, the online, online uh, entity route and have run into trouble. And where they run into trouble is when they want to get investors, or when someone leaves and they're unhappy, or when they want to, you know, when they're, everybody's happy at the beginning, when there's some unhappiness that creeps in, or when a an external party comes in and goes, you know, let I, I yes, I want to invest half a million dollars, but let me look at your cap table. I want to understand who owns what and what they're doing for it. And then all of a sudden somebody is unhappy or or the investor says, I'm not going to invest until you fix X, Y, and Z. And then you're ending up undoing things that can ultimately, not always, but can ultimately become more expensive than having paid a little bit upfront. So that the key to that is the difference between an LLC and a C corp. Investors will not invest in an LLC. That that is for sure. They will not. And and but even beyond that, if you have if you have given if you've given out equity and everybody owns it outright, you know, the reason people want vesting agreements is to make sure that the founders continue to work on the startup. And, and so, uh, so there, there are a lot of things that uh, are just best practices. Thank you. And, and if you're thinking about an entity that's going to, you know, maybe need multiple millions of investment that you're ultimately going to want to sell to a large company or, or you're gonna ultimately wanna license the intellectual property you've developed in the company beyond what you've, you know, it's, 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 it sounds expensive now because you don't have the money, but it's really hard to, it, it can cause problems later on. And in terms of that relation, uh, the relation of that cost in relation to the Manning Isles Awards, I just wanted to add a little bit here is that the Manning Isles funds, the real, the real spirit behind the awards is to really find, um, someone to lead your effort like a postdoc or a graduate student and to pay their salary as well as some material costs and supplies. That's the real sort of spirit behind what, what we're trying to seed and fund for your project's efforts. But that doesn't mean that we exclude um, your ability to use your funds for, for these types of costs. It just means that the, the, the reviewers, particularly external reviewers who are really experienced in the field will take a really close look at it and will we'll really, uh, you know, test whether or not that that's some, uh, 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 the best way to use those funds. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when applying for them. It's not, it's, it doesn't mean that your, your project won't be funded, but it is something that is typically scrutinized. I guess I'm confused on, on that. Are you saying that you will cover a company being incorporated or paying so, the leadership team? So typically um, in the past, the external reviewers have not really looked too favorably in paying someone like a CEO salary versus- No, but know, something team. towards that. Mm, again, I can't really speak to- them. You really don't want to do that. So I right. would- Here's here's what I, here's where the confusion might come in. Uh, if you have a postdoc who is the who's going to do the work, 
who's going to execute the statement of work and who intends to be the, the first CEO or the first lead of the company, which does happen and which that Y Combinator article talks about extensively, uh, then you know, you're sort of de facto paying the first CEO. Uh, if you're bringing in an outside party who's, who's coming in to raise funds, that's really not consistent with the spirit of, but, but um, you know, I think, I think that's separate from um, funding modest legal costs. Uh, you know, there's, I don't think anybody's budgeted as much as $10,000 for that. I could be wrong in the past, but that certainly is, is um, you know, something that, that within reason, reviewers are gonna look at as, you know, they're really thinking about the commercialization steps. Thanks, Karen. Yep, that's very helpful. And, and, and absolutely no PI salary, sorry. Just, just to continue on that vein, I'm still a bit confused as to, Hannah, Hannah led me to believe that it's not about building data, it, it's just enough money to build a prototype, but you're investing heavily into the building of the business team. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you will really need to have professionalize your leadership. And so there seems to be a conflict. I'm thinking of a postdoc who's good in basic sciences and has never led a business, then there seems to be a ga huge gap. So there, that, need to get there is, there is, this is not just a gap for academic startups or university startups. This is a gap for all startups that, that don't bring that kind of experience with the founders. And so, and so how can we get, how yeah. can we pay for to professionalize or so, so, our re so, leadership? Yeah, so typically, equity. sorry, Shelly. Equity. Uh, equity, exactly. So, so you, this goes back to how are you building your cap table? Are you giving them equity? But I would also say that uh, don't give away equity too soon. So this is why people build advisory boards. You build an advisory board and you figure out who, who is going to be helpful to your company, who's interested in, in leading your company. And very often, um, first CEOs will come in with the idea that when I raise the first round of venture funding or when we get the first SBIR, then I'm going to start to get paid something. So I th I th again, this is something that as you start to form the entity, uh, you know, an experienced startup attorney, not all attorneys have this ability, but an experienced startup attorney who's working actively with university startups and knows sort of what's industry standard uh, can be really helpful. But the but the but it's it's not the sort of thing where you put out a one to add and look at you know at resumes and then hire somebody. That's quite also true putting it on the timeline though, before somebody's going to say, okay, I'll do this, I'll be your CEO for some equity, you really have to be getting out toward the timeline where you've already gotten the SBIR and we're kind of off. Not necessarily. No? Not necessarily. It, 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 it depends on, you know, it depends. And, and Often, I think, in my experience, people won't say, "I want to be your CEO," but you'll develop, you'll develop, a, a, you know, a cadre of advisors who you may meet with once a month or once every two months. You get to know them over time. So, so I'm a big advocate of, or they do your iCore mentor thing, where where the NSF explicitly says you may not have an agreement to be on board the company before you're the industry mentor, but you get a deep dive into working with that person. So, so there are lots of different ways actually to start thinking about who's gonna lead the company long before you're ready to hire a CEO. And to me, the best cases are when there's a lot of confidence, everybody has a lot of confidence that the relationships are gonna work. 
Karen, do you encourage most of the people to um, get involved with the, um, um, God, my phone is still on, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> with my, uh, with the um, Mass Bio PI program and the Mass Connect program. I so sure they do. get circled with a lot of mentors. I sure do. Example of how we all got around Carlos. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, several of the people here today have been part of the Mass Connect PI program. Uh, for all of you who know Nella Von Dessel and Ernest Pharmaceutical, she went through the Mass Connect program. Mass Connect PI right now is on hiatus, unfortunately. Um, but we are, we are, this is uh, one of the things that I'm really committed to this year is, is, is upping, upping the, my game and the fellows game on supporting uh, mentoring relationships. You can do, you can do your own. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so, uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we are trying to help on this. And I'll just, I just, because Shelly mentioned how she's working with Carlos Gradil, I just want to mention that Shelly, who is an external advisor to Carlos's team, Carlos Gradil's team, uh, you know, we've, we got engaged with, with Shelly through Mass Connect PI. And, 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 and so, you know, and so now we've been working together for several months. And that's the kind of thing. You, I have been on board startups where, where they bring in a CEO that somebody met on the airplane and you know they had one really good conversation and, and next thing you know, somebody new is running the company and I have never seen that work well. I'm sure there must be some times when it does, but I've never seen it work well. Karen, I have, I have a naive question. So in the, the last maybe 10 or 15 minutes, a conversation is, going around this question, how you uh, grow your leader, like as postdoc, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, does it mean that uh, for the PI, like a faculty from UMass to become a, a leader of the company uh, is impossible at all or not uh, favorable or? So, so you're allowed, <laughs> so faculty at UMass, you know, by policy, you have one day a week to do external activities. Mm -hmm. And you are going to be governed by a conflict of interest plan that is actually a good thing in my view, because it, it protects you in a lot of different ways um, and, and helps you to manage the relationship with, say, a postdoc who came from your lab or a graduate student who's in your lab who may be working with you on the company, but is also doing, uh, you know, graduate research. And so, so, but if you think about just assuming you want to stay on as a faculty member, and I would never want to discourage that. Um, you know, you have one day a week, and it's just to me, at least, it would be really hard to run the company and have your have your day job as well. The most typical, uh, the most typical approach is. Uh, for the faculty inventor to be the head of the science advisory board and really uh, uh, support the management of the technical team without having to do the actual management of the technical team. So, uh, you know, charting strategic direction, uh, meeting with potential investors, that kind of thing is often part of that, that role. Uh, and then, and to Joe's point, just about a, a postdoc or a, you know, or a recent graduate, I think thinking is starting to change on that. If you read the Y Combinator article, it, the postdoc may not be the CEO three years from now or two years from now, but the postdoc may be the person to get the, the venture started to the point where it can attract an experienced um, CEO. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, well, I'm just going to share one more slide, which is this slide, which is a lot of links to the intellectual property resources I mentioned, uh, also to uh, my 
uh, IELTS Venture Development, our innovation services. You can read there about um, what we, our approach at IELTS Venture Development. I'm always happy to talk to everyone about that as well. Uh, the business innovation fellows that we, that we, uh, uh, that are really just an integral part of the venture development team and really provide the, the muscle to, to get stuff done. Um, the i -Corps program, the i -Corps at UMass program, we are need, we know we need to set up fall dates. Um, we're gonna be doing that soon. The, another shout out to the UMass libraries. There is just a wealth of business resources that you would pay a ton for if you were, um, uh, if you did not have access to the library. The, one of the ones I'll mention is CB Insights, which is a database of other startups. Super important for if you're thinking about researching who might be an investor in your technology or in your company, or looking at potential competitors and wanting to know how much funding they've gotten and all of that and who's funding them. Uh, so super important resources at the library. And then for funding, uh, you know, just, I wanna give a shout out to Maroon Venture Partners, which is, if for those of you who don't know them, they are a venture fund that uh, is committed to, uh, to uh, funding uh, ventures with a UMass affiliation. There is grant and equity funding, both from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. There's there, a there is money, I thought it's just grant, it's just, um like loans? Uh, well, they give them in the form of convertible notes. So, so it's, you know, it, it, it's, I think of it as dilutive funding. The, um, Mass Ventures uh, is another organization that uh, has both a mix of grant and equity funding available. Um, the National Science Foundation Innovation Corps National Teams Program straight grant to do customer discovery, to go out and interview a hundred, talk to a hundred potential customers and test out whether they're really interested in what you're building. Uh, the National Science Foundation Partnership for Innovation uh, program, which is grant funding uh, for translational research and proof of concept research. Uh, SBIR, of course, SBIR covers nine federal agencies. Each program is a little different. Uh, and you need to look at each one and then venture well, which is this um, uh, funding for STEM students who are, uh, you know, interested in, in taking it, inventions all the way through to innovations and commercialization. So I'm going to stop. Sh oh, and lastly, it's okay not to have all the answers. So sign up for our office hours. Uh, the the signups, the registration is on the Manning Isles webpage. You might have to scroll down a little bit for it, but the Business Innovation Fellows are doing these venture assessment office hours on um, the 24th. So that's uh, Thursday, uh, two to four, and uh, just sign up for a slot. They've all three of them gotten quite a bit of experience working with startups already and working through these. Our experience is that, um, teams, venture teams tend to be very hard graders. And so this is a really great way of you thinking through with someone else, um, how to think about where you are in the commercialization process and uh, really identifying gaps that you would wanna pay attention to. Uh, and then uh, uh, Karen and Hannah office hours or Hannah and Karen office hours, Fridays two to four uh, uh, through mid July, right Hannah? Yes, so it's going to be every Friday, starting with this Friday uh, through July 9th is the last okay. office hour we have. And then you're going to be emailing out these slides along with a link to the recording. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to stop now. Thank you, Karen. That was a great presentation. Um, if you have any other questions for us, please sign up for an office hour slot. Um, we can also be reached by email. Thanks everyone for joining us today. So Thank all. you. Bye. Bye, take care.